If you're a theater kid, at some point you'll have at least heard of the works of Anton Chekhov. No, silly, not the short stories. I'm, I'm talking about his playwriting career. See, he wrote four pretty famous plays by theater history standards, The Seagull, Uncle Vanya, Three Sisters, and The Cherry Orchard, all labeled comedy, all of which to young, naive students will undoubtedly seem old and stuffy and boring and kind of a downer. This is likely because you're given an utterly dry translation of these plays, translations that still call it morphia instead of morphine, for example, and your eyes kind of slide off the page. Besides, he's old. He died in 1904. That, that's 120 years from now, almost to the day. Who cares? Well, obviously I care. And to you, I say watch Shivani on 42nd Street. Honestly, the thing about plays is that they aren't really art. Like, <laughs> hold on. Um, the, the script isn't art. Not in the same way that the production is, right? This is maybe not as sweepingly true, but that's beyond the scope of this video. But the idea is that a play is like a skeleton of something. The words, the general idea of how it should be composed is there, but it's a creature that needs things beyond what it literally is on the page to exist. And what a talented group of artists can do with something as seemingly dreary and miserable as the four major plays of Chekhov's is really highlight why he calls them comedies. Vanya on 42nd Street does this with remarkable elegance. Characters so full to bursting with their interior desires and needs and anguishes, all laughing and mocking each other and drinking until things just kind of burst out of them. A scene can be so close and vibrant and hilarious and then... No. No. I'm talking about this because of a lot of reasons. Uh, culturally, we like to think about comedy and drama as two distinct ideas, e even sometimes two distinct genres. Maybe you had a teacher at some point tell you that uh, to Shakespeare, a comedy is a play where everyone gets married at the end, while a tragedy is when everyone dies. And obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that, even in the false gender binary of Shakespeare's work. Oftentimes, uh, comedy, drama, anger, love, misery, these things are expressed in the movement between one and the other. Uncle Vanya is full of mean girl shit until it just slips out a little too much. These little moments of masks breaking that so casually undo people. Yelena's rejection, Alexander's self-generated idea to sell his daughter's estate. These things don't seem like the sort of actions that would bring Vanya to such an extreme as taking the gun in the house and... Hey, that's probably the way you all know about Chekhov, right? Like, he's the guy from the gun you all like so much. Anyway, we're going to be talking about Bright Eyes. Uh, specifically, there's a song from this band that's stuck in my head for over a decade. I was introduced to it as uh, the saddest song the band ever penned. And now that I'm buried in the trash of my own brain, burnt out from my work on summer vacation and feeling genuinely pretty low, maybe it's time to think about sad music. Okay, so, uh, Bright Eyes. I do not know why I find it easier to explain to my audience musicians like Kendall and Patricia Taxon than Connor Oberst's main band, Bright Eyes. They were, like, indie famous? I don't know how to explain this. His work gets reviewed in Rolling Stones magazine and the tenuously still alive Pitchfork. They've performed on late night TV. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I can't bear to just introduce them to you all as though he's some unknown fringe musician, but... Here's the thing, a lot of early critical reception to him and his band was pretty interesting. Critics have called him the next Bob Dylan, he had two singles in the number one and two of Billboard's uh, 100 for like a hot sec, but my most personal memory is one of kind of constantly defending him to my peers and my mom. If, if you're reading and or watching this right now, hi mom! Uh, see, Bright Eyes is kind of a bummer, or at least a lot of their work can be. Oberst started making music and performing at 13. By the time he was 18, he had released his first major album, the Ivanov tour story, Letting Off the Happiness. Uh, Letting Off the Happiness is rough. It's weird to talk about because there's so much of it that is very aware of its edges and sloppiness and kind of revels in that. I, I really only want to bring up two things here since this is setting a, a to get us to the actual main character of this essay. Firstly, their opening track, If Winter's Ends, is just a flat-out banger. Like, one of his best songs, I adore it. Uh, second is that last track, Teresa and Thomas. Um, 
It's about six minutes of a song, followed by like 14 minutes of a repeated droning feedback before it collapses in the 21 minute mark into a solo rendition of the song Con Contrast and Compare, which was a song earlier in the album. It's a very weird, distorted rendition of it, and it doesn't last long before it devolves and disfigures into the haunted echoes of the harsh noise that introduced the album. It's a weird, daring move that just doesn't get a lot of attention outside of a handful of reviews calling it bad and one calling it good, but the review is written like Zelkov from Fire Emblem Engage for some reason. Why do you attempt to throw away your life? I bring this up specifically because there is an unmistakable tension in talking about this band. A lot of Ober's early popularity stems from his youth. It was novel that a 13-year-old had the kind of determined confidence to perform live like that, to compose music and recklessly release it in his actual first album, the collection of songs written and recorded from 1995 to 1997. And it's a brand he remained very conscious of into his early adolescence. Teresa and Thomas reveals some interesting fascinations he has as a musician. Fascinating I find go understated by critical reception because people mostly focus on his writing and his distinct voice with, you know, a passing mention to his long-term collaborators Mike Mogus and Nick Wal Walcott's production sensibilities. It's strange, too, because from a very early age in his work, Oberst has specific musical fascinations, among them the book-ending obsessions with noise in his albums, uh, something that he'll be invested in for all of the major albums we're talking about, finally departing from that and I'm Wide Awake It's Morning's story time. See, this kind of avoidance of approaching him as a musician, favoring him as a lyricist, I think paints a narrow picture of him, and I think that reason is that, well, his work can kind of feel amateurish, right? You can see this in a lot of Pitchfork reviews of his early work. Oberst, by the time he was notable enough to get that kind of attention, had a level of legitimacy that clearly made these reviewers at least hesitate to say that he sounds like an amateur in so many words. Chord progressions are simple, accompaniment tends to be kind of limited to what he could find among his friends, his voice is very classically powerful and his singing not particularly complex. His first two major releases were very lo-fi, but because the ideas in the songs, the intensity of his investment in execution are so present, it's a little hard to make such a damning accusation. A case in point, I feel terrible saying this about a guy's work I've been a massive fan of since high school, but I'm pushing through this because I want to kind of break down the idea that amateur work is bad or shameful. Look, um, a small tangent. I appreciate all of the positive messaging online on making art. A lot of people are out there insisting that the only way you get good at something is by spending a long time sucking at it, and that making art isn't supposed to be an investment in like profitable talent, but a thing we do as people because it's in our nature to express ourselves. And these are all fine things to say, I'm happy it's out there, but I want to push things a little further. Making something, improving at something, is a process, but it doesn't have to be a process that makes a bunch of useless garbage until you're good. Learning and making art in that field anyway can be very interesting and informative on what you value and think about as an artist. I also want to restate that this can sound like I'm calling his early work shit, and I want to reaffirm that I think his early work is great. I, I just think that it doesn't have the refinement he gets around I'm Wide Awake It's Morning and missing that refinement affords us a peek behind the curtain. And that's something I want to explore by looking at letting off the happiness, even through the crunchy lo-fi production, the kind of sloppy duets, the very specific quality of his voice that makes it sound like he recorded this while having a cold. Like, you can see the seeds of his musical aspirations. Another common thing to point out in his work is that it's usually kind of dour. He's a sad boy making sad boy music, but there is something distinctly uncomfortable about it. Let me explain. So, Fevers and Mirrors is our next stop on the way to the point of this video, and here's where I think we need to address Oberst's writing. I am trying to express that he is more conscious of the non-lyrical parts of his songs, but I do also recognize that his writing is his strongest tool in the kit. He's gained some notoriety for the distinctly political bent to a lot of his later work, and he has been very vocal about being staunchly anti-war. If by any miracle he's watching this video, I really hope he's taking care of himself, considering the sheer agony of bearing witness to an invasion and multiple genocides. 
I do, however, want to talk about this, and I want to talk about it in the Siegel album, Fevers and Mirrors, an album that is both deeply, almost violently personal, and very aware of his reputation for confessional writing. So, it's important for later, but Oberst's early albums have this anger to them, and as a result, I spend a lot of time in high school trying to explain that he isn't an emo artist. This was exhausting and often fruitless because this is the late 2000s and my friends and I were obsessed with subgenres and, and, and I can't remember why. I still don't know how to categorize Bright Eyes and at this point, I, I want to just say that I'm ignorant and neurodivergent and literally cat to sidestep the conversation entirely, but high school me made one interesting observation I want to revisit. A lot of emo music that I listened to back then had an external venom to them, where Connor Oberst has been deeply self-aware, even in some of his angriest tracks. Now, I disavow my almost two decades old comments on emo music because of a massive sampling bias, but his introspection is one of the most compelling parts of his work. Even as Pitchfork blasts him for slipping into the occasional platitude, his writing remains magnetic to hear through his shaky voice, some kid screaming that he knows not who he is, trying to express an anguish that is maybe more complicated to put to words than simple youthful ennui. Uh, granted, Fevers and Mirrors is rough. Like, at times listening back, it, it, um, it gets a little incel light. Like, a lot of bitterness around women into other guys that won't treat them right, but he just as readily turns his anger inward. And as a kid, that had a lot of self-loathing. This is probably what drew me to this album. A fun fact, this was the first physical album I ever bought. What? Wow. Now, one more thing. I want to talk about the interview. In the penultimate track, An Attempt to Tip the Scales, the song ends and turns into a mock interview about the album's release and fictional reception. Pitchfork lambasted this as some of the most fake, deep, pretentious shit the now mystery writer has ever heard. I hate to sound haughty, but I've honestly never witnessed such tasteless, ostentatious self-promotion on an album by anyone. I actually disagree, though. Like, the weird thing about being an artist that writes so personally is that a lot of energy in the fanbase tends to be spent trying to turn said artist's life into deep lore. Does he have a dead little brother? Did he attempt suicide? Has he worked on his drug and alcohol problem? And this interview is very obviously his response to the heightened scrutiny on deeply personal parts of his life. And like, yes, he has written about things that feel deeply personal. It feels like he's inviting this, but... Importantly, he isn't. His life, fictional or otherwise, is his muse to draw on, not something to be chronicled. So this interview is a meta-barbing of this kind of obsession, complete with cute commentary on his critics as well. Like, like he even asks the fake interviewer to stop the droning noise as a little nod to, ter to Teresa and Thomas. Can you make that sound stop, please? Yes. This kind of self-reflection is what I wanted to bring up. It's important to have spent a million years talking about this stuff to highlight his intentions as an artist, the kind of push and pull between his external frustration with the world and his deep-seated introspective anguish is the through line to a lot of his writing, even all the way to his current work, though the balance has shifted pretty significantly. By the way, what happened in America in the year 2000? So... I'm going to name and shame myself a little here. Oberst has made no effort to hide his anti-war position. He fucking hates war, if you didn't know. And I, in my early to mid-twenties, kind of felt above him on that front. Like, war is complicated, and I never have been an advocate for murder or killing or excessive violence. But I also, enlightened adult I was, recognized that things are complicated. Sometimes armies are necessary because of bad political actors, etc., etc., I'm not going to say that I'm strictly wrong about this, but after what's been happening the past almost a decade, Jesus Christ, I can more readily appreciate his sentiments now. Anyway, lifted his bright eyes on the grand stage. Oberst is done making small, intimate, angry albums about his personal dissatisfactions and is now crushingly aware that his home country is stricken with a conservative president that has declared war on a foreign country. This isn't a protest album, though. Not 
entirely. Oberst has more going on here, a, a lot more, enough that he has an orchestra for it. See, this may be his angriest Bright Eyes album in total. We have tracks like Don't Know When But A Day's Gonna Come, Make War, and Let's Not Shit Ourselves, Method Acting, Lover I Don't Have To Love, but essential to the conceit of this tenuously concept album is love. Aw, cute. What? No, uh, hear me out. Uh, this album is almost exactly as much about love as it is about the war on terror or his own anguish at his personal struggles. And the journey, the story that's in the soil, is the traveling between these extremes. His need for love, his shattered faith in his country, and his seething self-destruction. It's why Bowl of Oranges, with its kind of cheesy sentimentality, doesn't ruin the tone of the album. He's been yelling and screaming about trying to find love since the very first track. Cause there's been a great deal of discussion, yes, about the properties of man. And a mole or angel, you are carved from bone, but your heart is just sand, and the wind is gonna scatter it and cover everything with love. So if it makes you happy, then keep kneeling, mama. But I'm standing up. That finally lands us here. Let's talk about his saddest song. Waste of Paint is about six and a half minutes of him, his guitar, and his voice telling little vignettes of misery. He talks about a friend who hates himself, a woman who gives up on life after being cheated on, his brother getting a DUI, a couple who are in love, this gives him agony, uh, his time people watching at the train station, and the finale visit to a church during choir practice. It is a stone-cold bummer of a song, and perhaps predictably, it is entirely consistent with the ideas Oberst is trying to express in this album. Zoning in on the final passage of the song gives us this. As I hold my tongue, forget the song, tie my shoes, start walking off, and try to just keep moving on with my broken heart and my absent God. I have no faith, but it's all I want to be loved and believe in my soul, in my soul, in my soul, in my soul. The obvious point made here is that in the effort for Lifted to express the polarizing forces of seething external hatred and debilitating internal desires for love and happiness, Almost every song in the album traffics in these things. Waste of Paint isn't unique here, but what is unique is its delivery. Bright Eyes is no stranger to having very raw, potentially autobiographical tracks like this one, but just one album ago, we had Oberst on record mocking his own self-seriousness and his fans' obsessions with it, turning his life into the early 2000s equivalent of deep lore. Even later additions to this time-honored tradition tend to put something else in the room with him. This is best exemplified by a recent re-recording of the song with the full band here to make it feel more vibes. Like you're not sitting in a room deeply uncomfortable as Connor practically shouts the shit at you. It's a fine retake of the song, except I hate it just a little bit. Uh, about as much as I hate the re-recording of the album If You're Feeling Sinister by Belle and Sebastian, the aspiration towards a higher fidelity, cleaner, fuller versions of iconic indie music can be a precarious one. And far be it for me to impose my dumbass perspective on these guys' interests in relitigating their old work, but there is something really gripping about sitting with this song blasting at you. It's violent and bitter and at times borderline incoherent. Like one of the passages is him seething at his happy friends because he's not happy. It's the kind of negative emotion that most people are constantly trying to pretend they don't feel because it's cruel to resent your friends. And it just goes all in on it. Uh, l let's break the song down actually uh, a little bit. Uh, hold on. So a quick breakdown on the structure of the song. I, I don't know nearly as much theory as I would like. Some of the terminology is bad. Uh, don't bully me. But the song is several repeated phrases that follow the same structure. I'm actually going to use my guitar for this bit. It's probably why my voice may sound weird right now. So the opening lines are always the same. i 
mostly made of pain. He wakes up, drives to work, and then straight back home again. Is the same as I knew when she was dignified and true. Her love for a man was one of her many virtues. The next couplet goes like this. Until one day she had found out that he had lied. She decided the rest of her life from that point on would be a lie. This, uh, arguably, like, the pre-chorus next, uh, I found the song generally easier to break down without trying to turn everything into, like, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, but, like, whatever. She was grateful for everything that had happened. She was anxious for all that would come next. And then here, uh, arguably the chorus is where the song's trick really lays out in full. See, like, everything about the song up to this point has been set in stone. Each phrase follows the same points, and each resolves the same way, but before that we have, like, the chorus or whatever, and while it's just, like, repeating movements back and forth between F and G, he doesn't have it go for a consistent amount of time for each phrase. Our example phrase goes on, like, way longer than any of the others, in fact. Look, uh, the, the, the control group, right? Uh, the first phrase chorus. Um, uh, and he said, Thank you, please, but your flattery is truly not becoming me. Your eyes are poor, you're blind, you see. No beauty could have come from me. I'm a waste of breath, of space. Verses, um, <laughs> and then she wept, what did you expect, in that big old house with the car she kept, and such is life, she often said, with one day leading to the next, you get a little closer to your death, which is fine with her, she never got upset, and with all the days she may have left, she would never clean another mess, or fold his shirts, or look her best. She was free to waste away alone. And now I have played parts of the song in maybe the weirdest way possible, thank you, and I am sorry. This fluidity within the pivotal moments of these phrases crafts a distrust between you and him, and it helps amplify the intensity of his feelings throughout, which is why I think the final phrase hits like a truck. See, the final phrase breaks the mood once more by extending out one of those couplets even further than before. So now I park my car down by the cathedral Where the floodlights point up at the steeples Quiet practice was filling up with people I could hear the sound escaping as an echo Sloping off the ceiling at an angle And when the voices blend they sound like angels I hope there's some room still in the middle and instead of being disorienting and jarring, the effect, paired with how soft his voice gets, feels deeply sentimental and introspective. And I think this is a good point to recognize that Oberst has had a running track record of songs in this album lashing out at external ailments, only to bend that anger back into introspecting self-loathing. He does this track to track, like the transition from Don't Know When But A Day's Gonna Come to the burnt out breath of air, Nothing Gets Crossed Out and even within the song itself, like method acting or waste of paint. Uh, the verse right before this is the first time he yells in the song, and it feels limp, uh, performative. He's pseudo-diegetically acting out the yell in the story the same way that he acts out the mistake in false advertising. Now all anyone's listening for other mistakes. Oh, I'm sorry. He is, if nothing else, deeply conscious of artifice in his music. If Fevers and Mirrors taught us nothing else, so for him to make the final phrase not hinge on his anger at the superficiality of the world in the face of genuine evil coming from our government and our media, but hinge instead on something as personal as his crisis of faith, as framed through a hyper-conscious reflection on his voice, a bit of a point of mockery in some critical reception to his music because, you know, listen to it. It's all shaky and wavering and he doesn't seem to have a big diverse range and he used to sing better when he was a kid and sang soprano even though all the bigger kids kept calling him a girl and threw rocks at him. Oh god, oh god. I got off topic. He rests 
this final moment here, partially because he undoubtedly is aware of his voice's reputation. He deliberately calls attention to himself as a singer three times in this album, but it comes off as so vulnerable and personal that when the song does the same thing it's been doing and drags you back under, he yells those final lines out. But it's all I want to be loved and believe in my soul, in my soul. This is why I want to talk about the notion of amateur art, and, and part of why I struggle to position Bright Eyes, even early, rough, unpolished, courtesy of Mike and Nate Bright Eyes, uh, as amateur or even unskilled art. As much as listening to these old albums makes me reflect on that Ira Glass quote about your taste outstripping your skill. That for the first couple years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's it's really not that great. It's it's trying to be good. It has ambition to good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. I think the more you go digging into Bright Eyes, the more undeniable his vision and execution of it is. His work carries the illusory feeling of amateur art because it's often lower fidelity and he has an unconventional voice and he doesn't compensate on either front with a kind of insane technical prowess Joanna Newsom has going for her. There's something unapologetic in his delivery that can get ornery pitchfork reviews calling him pretentious or calling him untalented Bjork, but you have to reckon with his intent. And it's something I've been revisiting myself. See, I keep talking about being a musician and, and the urge to get back into it has been plaguing me, but I am now in my 30s and as per the rules have become conscious of my life as an adult grown up person relative to people way younger and way more talented than me. This is by no means novel. I'm pretty sure almost everyone leaves their 20s and feels old all at once. But in doing so, I remember getting praised as a younger, sharper cat in my basic raw talent. I could pick up an instrument and figure out the basics of how to play it pretty easily. I, I was once proud to say, but now my vision, my taste, my interest in making music has been hamstrung by my dissatisfaction with my voice, what I used to consider my best talent, and the fact that a raw talent at futzing with a guitar or pianos left me still struggling to do something as simple as read sheet music, a skill I used to have. I think I have a good sense of rhythm and pitch, but when I record, I can only hear the small errors in everything I try and do. On top of how limited my toolkit is, I want to get into DAWs, I, I want to take inspiration from underscores and mod my voice, learn how to program a band and everything, but I, I may as well relearn all of music now, with my brain trying to convince me that I'm 10 years too late to do anything with my life. If you're my parents, please stop laughing at me for saying this. I know it's standard 30s anxiety, just, just let me say it out loud and move on. The point here is that uh, Bright Eyes was one of the bands that got me into songwriting in the first place. I modeled my early years as a musician on these albums. Their rough qualities, something I wanted to emulate because they felt real. And at some point, maybe around the time I transitioned and reckoned with the 2016 election, I found myself so cynical and bitter, so dissatisfied with this vision, so lost within my own depression, my desire to punish myself for my sins, to try and force myself to be reinvented, that I've now landed on the other side missing this band and what it did to me once upon a time. That my own vision as a critic could be so dismissive of his work because my taste had changed. That there's something ugly enough within me that I wanted to be above my own past. Uh, my youth was when I was allowed to wallow in these simple, easy songs about feeling miserable, only to now reflect back on my youth and realize how much I've been missing from those experiences. And I I've now spent years, like Uncle Vanya, writing and working and giving myself over to causes, to classes, to other people, in hopes that a sheer, simple, mindless dedication can absolve me of the inherent sin of my body and mind, but it, but it never does. The characters in Uncle Vanya toil and work and do what they can, how they can, all in hopes that this work can somehow purge them of their circumstances. Somehow, we can work ourselves to a better world where we can be our best selves, th that we can shed the weight that time, age, fatigue, sickness, and injury has saddled us with. Somehow, 
I will work and make a stable enough life that, like magic, I will face myself in the mirror and only find my beauty. The imperfect vessel shed completely away, but it won't happen. It won't happen for me or you or my parents or Vanya or Connor Oberst. Our work, what we put ourselves to, all of us, has to mean something else, something other than a means of escape. We have to work because it could make something better, even if it's something we may never get to see. A final thought. I talk a lot about my mental health on this channel, and often in unflattering ways. During my depressive episodes, I often gravitate to particularly morose artists and albums, and in doing so recently, I've realized why Bright Eyes' saddest song exists, why it works the way it does, why it can spin me into an anxious, self-destructive spiral over my perceived loss of myself as a musician. Sad art, downer art, pieces made to make you feel bad or whatever, aren't here to encourage you to feel worse a million years ago, ContraPoints made this observation with the sound of silence. Because sad people don't like happy songs, when you're sad, happy songs make you feel like you're being bullshitted. So we're 10 seconds into the song, Hello Darkness My Old Friend, the key is D sharp minor, the saddest of all keys. But when we get to the next line, because a vision softly creeping, something happens. Let's listen. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly creeping. Ah! What was that? Suddenly, a major chord, an unsuspected burst of sunlight through the clouds, and every peach fuzz hair on the back of my biologically female neck stands on end. Hello, light. I want to add on that waste of paint gives you no such release. No beautiful resolving to a major chord and angelic singing voices gently sweeping up above it, but instead perspective and a very deliberate kind of empathy. Empathy has been getting a bad reputation online because people keep on talking about it as something with moral obligations, something you need to extend to the people who are deserving of it. Connor Oberst in this song doesn't do this, though. This isn't empathy he's offering. This isn't a service he's trying to provide. He's not trying to tell you that things are okay and that he understands. He's telling you that he, in the depths of his worst feelings, his seething, hopeless frustrations with the world and himself, no matter how much he hates himself, is begging to be loved and to believe in his soul. It is a declaration front and center, and it is unshakable and powerful, an empathy you are free to give to him instead. He's not just like you, but in some ways you might be just like him. Thank you for watching. Special thanks to Alexi Angelica, Athena Stripes, Bees Louise, Blair Rennix, Blueberries in My Coffee, Cole Brayfield, Colleen T, Evan Kearns, Foxy Hex, Gail Simmons, Lewis Wells, Low Rez, Maria Aladren, Michael McNay, Mocha Lappin, Narai the Redmarked, Professor Bopper, St. Rawberry, Thomas Wolpez, Trade Good, Valerian Wraithwall, and Zetetic. Thank you all so much.